the challenge when you are making any action film uh, is normally hiding the fact that your actor is not actually doing the stunt and that a stunt man is performing it for them. Uh, the opposite is true for Mission Impossible. We're, we have an actor who does his own stunts and we're constantly trying to develop technologies to show him doing it. And with speed flying, there, uh, this was an extremely, extremely difficult challenge. How do you get a camera close enough to Tom uh, to show that he's actually uh, uh, operating the speed wing? And at the same time, how are you far enough back from Tom that you'd see that this isn't being done with wires, this isn't some sort of a trick? And so we had to develop a gimbal system that another camera operator would be uh, would be flying along with Tom while wearing. And so you had uh, cameras hanging off of both sides that were then being operated by a camera operator who was following in a helicopter. All of this uh, equipment did not exist. It all had to be uh, designed and purpose-built for the sequence. Very early on, I told Tom that, uh, that I wanted this next installment of Mission to have a sense of adventure. I wanted to make a bigger film, a, a more global film. Uh, and part of that was, uh, was making a more romantic film. And nothing felt as romantic to me as, as a train, as particularly the Orient Express. Um, and that, of course, when it, when it collides with Mission Impossible, turns into an action sequence on a train and it probably isn't going to end well for the train itself. Mission had done a train sequence before, all the way back in the first Mission Impossible. Uh, and a lot of that had been done on a stage. We wanted to do one that was practical. We wanted to build upon what was learned on that sequence and apply all of that knowledge to something practical and real. And that meant uh, building a train where Isai Morales, who plays our villain, and Tom could be fighting on the roof of that train and also uh, how to wreck the train, how to wreck the locomotive, and in so doing, how do you, how do you keep that as a sequence? Uh, the, once the train wreck happens, the sequence is over. How do we go beyond that? How do, how do you have a train wreck happen so that you can stretch the event out? It's not one simple cataclysm, but many. That, uh, that ambition, uh, evolved into what is now the train wreck in our film. And it, it quite literally is a train wreck happening in slow motion. It's a, uh, it was an extremely, extremely challenging sequence, not just to, uh, not just to execute, but also to, to design. It was working out the physics of what that would be and, uh, and, then, and then how to design all the different train cars and how to design all the equipment to shoot these stunts that we were uh, that we were creating. And we did not limit ourselves in the least based on whether or not something could physically be achieved. Uh, if we ran into an obstacle, we had to figure out how to overcome it. We didn't just allow ourselves to, to toss things out. And we created something that was, uh, that was quite challenging, quite, quite challenging. The thing I love most about working with Tom is he pushes you at all times to do your absolute best. You find yourself doing things you could never have imagined possible, uh, sometimes even the week before. I never set out to be a director. I certainly never set out to be an action director. I never, ever set out to be directing a film on this scale. And we're now at the point where you don't even have time to think about the scale of what it is you're doing you're simply doing everything you can to finish the story you've set out to do. With Tom, there are no limits he, he, there, and, and no limitations. He, he wants you to push him as much as he is pushing everyone else around him to do their best. Every film Tom and I make, uh, including Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning, involves taking all of the experience from all of the films we had made previously and applying it to this one. And with any luck and with a lot of great effort, uh, every film should stand on the shoulders of the film that came before it. Uh, we often like to say we're not competing with anybody but ourselves. We're looking at the last film and figuring how can we outdo that. 
the secret ingredient to that is not trying to make a a bigger, more spectacular film. It's trying to make a film that honors the films that came before it. You you ideally just want to make a movie that belongs in the list with all of those other movies. And because we have acquired so much knowledge in the development of these sequences, many of which had never been done in quite that way, um, we feel a little more confident and a little more adventurous each time in terms of how far we can push ourselves, how far we can take it. Tom and I are most interested in you having the most immersive emotional experience possible. We want you to be as connected to the main character of the story as possible. And the more we do that practically, the more real and the more immersive that feels. Uh, there is something tactile. There is something unpredictable. We could not have predicted uh, what the train looked like going off a cliff as realistically as it was depicted. For example, when that train launched off the cliff with cameras attached to the train, the rotation of the wheels created this strange sense of behavior in the cameras. Had we done it CGI, we never would have made that discovery. Uh, when we uh, when we um, were on the when we were on the gimbal and the train was bending in the way that it did, with all of the furniture behaving the way that it did, it uh, and there was grease on the floor. The actors are in, involved in something that is so unpredictable and so chaotic. There's an energy that you couldn't get from that uh, had you just created it with, uh, with CGI. The problem with CGI, and it's extremely useful in a lot of different ways, you get exactly what you want. And what we've learned from practical action, we very often don't get what we want. We get what mission gives us. We get what fate and circumstance and unpredictable physics give us. That gives you something real and chaotic and completely grounded that you couldn't get any other way. We lean into the chaos. The beauty of going and shooting in all of these different locations, we want to take the audience to places they might not otherwise be able to go. We want to transport you to another, uh, an, another country and celebrate another culture. Uh, and hopefully inspire you to go there. Um, we're very fortunate in that uh, it, w the, the places that we go are excited to have Mission Impossible come and show off their city. And, uh, and, and we were not disappointed this time. We had, a, we had a really warm welcome everywhere we went. Uh, and I think people were just very excited to see the world coming back to life. What I love most about Mission Impossible Dead Reckoning Part 1 is that every single actor in the story has their moment. Uh, they all have a chance to showcase their extraordinary talent. They all have their moment to be at the center of the story. And this cast uh, really delivered on a level that is, that is so extraordinary. Uh, they all leaned into the process. They were all inventive. They all gave themselves over to the unexpected. And as a result, they each deliver something truly unexpected. I had a great time um, working with both Haley and uh, Rebecca, who are just, they're great. Because Haley's like a, a ruffian in a sense, you know, like uh, rough around the edges, where, um, where Rebecca's character has, has seen a lot of life and is as graceful. You know, and, and even in her choices, you know, she's just, they're, they're wonderful people to play with and opposite. So I, I, for me, it's just, it's candy. And I got to tell you, those shooting those scenes um, took a lot, a lot of energy. They're a real team. And I think uh, they trust each other. They're grown up boys, <laughs> you know, because they're boys at the end of the day. Boys in a sandlot of your dreams, your wildest dreams. You want to jump off a cliff 4,000 feet above the, uh, you know, Norwegian Alps or whatever you call that? Uh, sure. You want to fly? You want to go here? You, you want to do the impossible? Let, we'll figure it out. We'll reverse engineer. We'll, they just have this kind of can-do attitude that, um, that makes you go, I may not know all of what's going on, but the end product is going to be satisfyingly great. That's the key. Satisfy that audience. Make sure they come back for more.
Tom and Chris are such movie, you know, goers, avid buffs, that uh, they really, really went, you know, beyond the distance to ensure that the big blockbuster on a big screen is still meaningful and has value. And movies are a form of our communities coming together, reminding each other why we're all human, because we react at the same time, usually to the same stimulus. <sighs> yes. <clears throat> you know, it brings us together. And I hope that never goes away. It's so surreal to have been a fan of this franchise and a fan of Chris McQuarrie's work and Tom Cruise's work. And then to be sat in a car on a set, handcuffed to Tom Cruise. And at one point I went, I looked at him and I went, I, I'm in a Tom Cruise movie. And he, without, without pausing, went, no, 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 no. I'm in a Hayley Atwell movie. And he was, he's so generous that way. He really bolsters people and, and he really wants to see them do well. And so with every kind of expression of excitement um, of being in this surreal world from being behind the camera watching a mission film to being within the kind of mechanics of a Mission Impossible film, there were lots of pinch me moments and he had them with me along the way. I had five months of training. Um, it was an amazing, very rare and unusual opportunity to be working with the kind of stunt team and prop masters and um, choreographers that that Tom, you know, finds and discovers they're really the best in the world at what they do. And so I was introduced to all these different disciplines from mixed martial arts to working with, uh, working on a gun range with various different kinds of guns, um, various different props, and also doing unarmed combat. And what I discovered is that I had a natural ability and an enjoyment of doing fight sequences with props, that if you gave me two knives, I could actually speed up the choreography of the fight because I was using these props as an extension of Grace's mood. They gave me kind of anchor points and something to something more physically to do than just using my fist. Joining the gang as Haley is a lot more fun than Grace joining the gang the first time because she doesn't know what she's getting herself into and she is not convinced that they've got her back. So she's hyper vigilant and on guard, but for Haley coming into an already very established friendship group that Tom and, and Simon and Ving have had and enjoyed for many, many years, it's like, it, it's so, um, it's, it's incredibly welcoming and it's also upbeat and it's fun and they have lots of in-jokes based on all the experiences that they've had around the world for the many years that they've been working on these together. The thing I love most about working with Simon Pegg is there is this sweet spot where we can really make each other laugh. And that becomes quite dangerous when you're in the middle of a very important scene where the stakes are very high. Um, but because he is so much of the comic relief as Benji, and because I've enjoyed watching him play Benji for so long now, being on the receiving end of that in a scene is is it's hard sometimes because it's just so funny. And um, he's great at sort of, he's great at teasing, you know, a playful teasing of, of me and making sure that, you know, there's a levity and approach to it. So it can be very focused and very intense and very sincere set, but he's always there to, um, you know, pull the rug from under my feet and make sure that I'm also having fun while I'm doing it. Ving has um, such gravitas. His presence is so, um, I find it very calming to be around him because he has so much wisdom and so much experience in this industry and such a force for good. And all the work that he does outside of being an actor and the supporting the communities that he grew up in um, to be this an extraordinary person and um, a devoting a life of service to other people. The thing that you know the world knows about Mission Impossible is it's all about the locations. That sets the visual language of the film. And every single film tries to top itself with and outdo itself with where it can go next. Where are the locations that have not been seen on film or been able to be depicted in a particular way? 
And I would say that the locations and then the stunts become the sort of in the foreground of what the film will be. They become the ultimate backdrop that then dictate what the action is gonna be and also indeed what the story is. Um, Tom loves to travel the world and to discover new, um, you know, new cultures and, and communities of people and find out what is unique about that particular location. And then, then sort of as a love letter to the location creates Mission Impossible. <laughs> Mission Impossible is a love letter to the incredible diversity of this planet. I knew when I when I got the, the job that there would be about a five month training period where it would be not that we were chasing a particular style or a particular aesthetic, but we were seeing where my natural abilities, strengths and interests lie and therefore creating a bespoke training program so that I could competently uh, and safely do these stunts. And so the motto that I, I ran with, literally, uh, <laughs> was to be fit for purpose. So my uh, we tried lots of different disciplines and what I felt most um, connected to was uh, y working with knives and working with more um, styles of mixed martial arts that were a lower center of gravity. You know, Pom is incredible at these high kicks. And I found that I was much more of um, a wrestly kind of fighter and a scrappy one and very fast with, um, with knives and with props. And so we use that as the character and we use that as part of um, the training process so that I was able to get to a level of competence where I knew that I was able to do certain stunts over and over again from different angles with, with you know, dynamic movement. And um, I found that, you know, that whole, that whole experience changed my life because it meant that my, I was able to start to put myself in, out of my comfort zone, but also be able to control my nervous system so that I was able to push myself further physically. What became very apparent early on in my preparation and my research and my training for mission, without a script necessarily, or particular anchor points of who my character was gonna be, is Chris McQuarrie and Tom Cruise's uh, drive, passion, commitment for the actresses that they employ coming in or the actors that they employ coming in to uh, really play and to collaborate and to offer lots of different ideas and to be fully seen and heard in them and having great, honest, direct communication about things that we wanted to try or that I was confused about and needed clearing up on. They are so transparent in their process and very inclusive in that. And I felt incredibly safe. And I also thought I wanna come in and offer something new. You know, I wanna be offering something that hasn't been seen before in a mission film because it's already such a, be a beloved and established franchise that I would have to offer something new. Otherwise I'm either going over old ground or it's already been done before or the audience don't have a new emotional attachment to my character because it's the same it's always, that it's always been. And I knew that I wanted to try and elevate Grace out of just being one thing or the representation of the new woman coming in um, so that it felt much more expansive than that. Chris McQuarrie, he is a visionary. He is innovative. He's an amazing actor. He can perform an, an, the entire story for you in front of you over dinner. And he knows the points to make you cry, to make you laugh, to make you sit on the edge of your seat. He, it's like he's kind of understands the musicality of storytelling and how to hit all these beats. Um, and then the next day he can come up with a completely different version of what he wants the plot to be. And it can be just as good and detailed and captivating Tom and McHugh's working relationship is forged over, I think, 16 years of friendship and a deep appreciation and understanding of film, uh, the technical sides of it, but also about storytelling. And so I've come into their orbit at a time where it's so sort of finessed in terms of their language of how they communicate on a set 
that they're finishing each other's sentences and they're sort of mind reading. Tom can go, hey, McHugh, and Tom and McHugh will be like, yeah, I agree. And you're like, what, <laughs> what was that exchange, you know? Um, and there is a, they both challenge each other and they both, they're both very strong, strong-willed, independent leaders and yet they complement each other because it's a foundation of utter respect about what the other can do. And they are, they, they, it's a symbiotic relationship that they, they kind of, they come hand in hand. Mission Impossible, Dead Reckoning Part One. This blows everything out of the water from what Tom has done before. His scale of ambition for this to be the most mind-blowing, gut-wrenching, physical, visceral experience of an adventure movie that gets to the heart of friendship and uh, the good fight of uh, triumph over adversity and the power of the human spirit. This is unlike anything that audiences will have ever seen before because the technologies used to create it weren't invented until it, this was shot, even on a technical level. Audiences are going to have the ride of their lives. They'll want to see it in the cinema over and over again. So 25 years ago, almost to the day, uh, I get a call from my rep saying they want to bring Kittredge back. And I think it's a joke, of course, on some level. It's not. They want to bring him back. So what a thrill it is to uh, dig around, find a character when you're in your 30s and then get to go back and redevelop the character after so much apparent life experience and funnel that into, um, into the franchise. It's an absolute gift, especially with McHugh and Tom at the helm. So one of the great things about being offered a role in one of these productions is that the locations they shoot within are spectacular. Norway, Rome, Venice, uh, London, which has been gorgeous as well. Um, I was not, Mike Kittredge was not involved in the, in the uh, Italian section of the shooting, but he was involved in the Norwegian section of the shooting which was a thrill for me because years ago I, um, I learned to bring a companion with me when I, when I go on location. The companion is a camera. And so that encourages me to look more closely at whatever environment I'm in to try and be intimate with it through the lens. And Norway particularly is such, has such a beautiful landscape to it. From Kittredge's perspective, the Ethan Hunt many years ago his mission is the same. It's a personal mission of right and wrong, and, and I'm going to do whatever I can to promote an idea of compassion and rightness, which is very subjective, but, but I think most of us can feel what rightness is. And so his mission at that point, either it was a calling or whatever, is very clear that anything and everything will be done before I pass away to have that in the library of human experience for Ethan, a young one. That's still very much alive today. However, he's been through the, more of the spectrum of human endeavor, be it uh, beneficial or the opposite of that. McHugh and Tom are a very dynamic duo in that I find Tom to be, to be super focused and capable. I mean, the stunt people that I've talked to uh, who have worked with Tom will tell me that he is among the most intelligent actors they've ever met in terms of their body and how their body works and where it is at a certain time. And his focus on the elements that surround him and his ability to bring them in and focus them on the task at hand is extraordinary. McHugh does the same thing, but with a different flavor. McHugh seems to be able to look at the big picture, absorb what's coming at him in terms of 
the flavors, the, the set, the, the actors, what they're bringing to the scene in that particular take. And he's able to massage it, I think, I feel, in a way that allows the audience to focus on all of those elements, like a Bach concerto, where if you want to, you can follow a single line of music and you can hear it throughout, or you can sit back and get the gestalt of it. And McHugh does that beautifully. And Tom is the more focused element in that piece of music, I think. So they work beautifully in that regard. But they are by no means, I think, similar. They are dynamic. Yeah, I was overexcited to be part of the movie. Um, it was one of my dreams to, to be part of the franchise, for sure. And I was actually training, um, uh, stunt training and doing martial arts training in order to do, you know, an action movie. And um, it's funny because in my schedule, sometimes in my iPhone, I would write Mission Impossible sometimes because it was like one of my dreams. So it was like, you know, I wanted to manifest it and it happened. <laughs> So I've been training really hard, for sure, with uh, with Wade Eastwood, who's the the stunt coordinator on the movie, who's incredible and who's worked on the previous movies as well, um, and with uh, with Sam Eastwood, who happens to be his wife, but who's um, who's been training me too. I've been doing some Pilates with her, some um, core um, workouts. I mean, like to make sure that I don't like injure myself, and some sprints, some runs in the park, uphill. So that's hard. And, um, and of course, uh, fight training with, um, with a stunt crew, uh, doing some kickboxing, boxing, um, um, yeah, any kind of fight training. And also we wanted to find the style of the character. So they wanted to see what I was good at, what I was better at. And we kind of like shaped uh, the fight style of the character um, depending on what I could bring. And also before getting cast in the movie, I was training also with the martial arts. Uh, with a martial artist uh, called Jason Noviello, who um, who used to be a stuntman, so he taught me a lot of, of you know a lot of things martial arts wise. Uh, McHugh is incredible to work with, and he's so he's so smart. He's such a good writer, and he's he's also I'm so impressed by you know the fact that he's such an incredible writer, but he he can convey so many emotions by actually not making us speak, you know, by the placement of the camera, the angle, the, the way he directs us even physically. And, um, you know, it's going to be uh, the composition of the frame, you know, he has such amazing taste with how to compose, you know, like how, how to move things around um, within the frame and that gives power to a character or like a different emotion. Haley plays her character equal to all the other characters. She brings enormous wit and humor and intelligence. There's a lightness to her and obviously this is her character, but this is also Haley. Um, it's phenomenal being around such a quite scarily smart and witty woman um, and she needs to be you need to be on this set you need to find your character I remember um, one of my first meetings with Chris and he said to be able to be a part of this mission team you need to figure out who you are in this constellation of people not only your character but actually your character on set and she found her straight away and I think Chris and Tom and all the producers did very well when they chose not only her, but Pom as well. Everyone has an individual plan to how they like working and how they like building up. You know, it's not just building up body and muscle, etc., but it's actually repetition, it's muscle memory. It's, there's so much into it. It's not just creating a shape of your body. It's actually about being able to, to have the strength to do what you need to do. And that is not only stunt work. Stunt work is coordination. It is um, the actual, the fight moves, the, the, the looking good whilst punching. You know, it's, it's for camera. It's camera punching and camera kicks. What I've understood of this film and what I've understood working and listening to McHugh throughout the films we've worked together, he has always been growing into wanting to deep dive into the darkness of each and every character. I love the fact that every time there's a scene with a woman, 
or a man, but we're discussing women right now. It's how do we make this person interesting? Who is this person? It's not just about making the women strong and the men strong, it is finding the character within. And that brings us back to the fact that Chris and Tom are extremely character driven. And that makes me proud. McHugh has managed throughout the times and the years of working with Tom, not just with Mission, but with all the other films that he's done, found this ingredients, found this relaxation in leaning back. As he himself said, he leans back and lets the story just unfold in front of him. I love bringing Ilsa to life with Chris McQuarrie, with Wade, with Tom, with Sam, with everyone that has, and Lucy, everyone that's been involved to help create the character with physical, emotional um, aspects. But one of the best things is the fact that I get to, to do all of the, the stunt work. I keep on coming back to that. I mean, what stands out from any different sort of film that I've done is the fact that She's so unpredictable, and with that unpredictability and that sort of self, the need for self guidance or line, she, she walks her own way, she walks her own path. All these great places that we've been to, whether it's Abu Dhabi or Venice, or, they open, they open, they let us have the run of the place, which was incredible. So you're filming at these magnificent places you've always heard or been to but you've heard about so you find yourself in Venice in these 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 alleyways and the claustrophobic nature of it adds such tension to the piece um, you know we're jumping we're jumping over canals running over bridges and it just to me it adds um, it adds you know what you're looking for is a visceral quality a quality that the audience um, is there with you and that's again cut to come back that's one of the keys of this of this whole franchise when you actually see it when you actually see tom do what he does risk his life for a film it's it's beyond anything i'd seen because you know he's not a stunt man he's an actor and then when you see him do it, I think, again, I word, use that word visceral, you see him on the motorcycle, on the motorbike, you see him actually jumping. There, there is no CGI. That's where people, I think, and it, they're going to be amazed. It's, it's nothing short of amazing. I mean, he did the stunt over, he did the, the jump over and over again, and it never got old. It never got old because you know he's right there whizzing by on a, on a chopper, waving to us, you remember, waving to us. And then he would just, he would do these practice runs where he just would jump. And I think he has 1.2 seconds if anything goes wrong, 1,001 to, to course correct. So in the second, seven seconds to, to the bottom of the bowl, it was, it's, it's like nothing I've ever seen. We were able to, to do something that you couldn't do on green screen. You know, there's just no way you could, you could capture what we were capturing up there on that train. You know, they don't make movies like this anymore. They don't, they just don't do it. And uh, these guys continue to find a way to, to do this. And it's, a, it's, it's as exciting as anything I've done. Because whether you're doing an independent or whether you're doing the biggest, the biggest action film that there's going like this, you're still trying to have moments of, um, of uh, uh, connection. And so when you're talking to Tom and you know that anything could happen at any moment, you could fall off the train, it's there. So you don't, you're just in the moment with him, you know? It's as good as it gets. It's always lovely to get back into this sort of family because, you know, I've been in it for 15 years and obviously I've known Tom for a long time and Ving as well, both. Um, and so it's always a reunion when we see each other, you know, and it's always a delight. And we always get very excited. We talk a lot about crushing it. You know, we do a lot of fist bumping and giggling and, uh, 
it's it's lovely and but then also to uh, to welcome in new people and we were straight off into location so we were in norway and 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 italy and that that time we were all spent in a in a hotel together and because of covid um protocols we all had to kind of eat in a dining room so we spent so much time together so we all bonded very quickly so the new family expanded at quite a um alarming rate if the audience see tom actually doing something it it's it, it's so much more effective than you know using vfx i think you can make anyone do anything these days you see people you see these big super creatures having fights with each other and punching each other all over the sky and it just you're just like nah. if you see someone actually doing it and you know that they're doing it there's an added degree of tension there there's a frisson that you have of like oh my god they did that so when people watch tom go off that cliff they won't only be thinking about ethan you know on his mission they'll be thinking that's actually tom and that adds something to the experience of watching the movie because there's genuine jeopardy we just has a really great understanding of the source material and um you know he he would be the first to kind of admit that he has grown as a director since even since rogue nation and he just really understands what this is he knows how to tell stories you know he's a he's an expert at that him and tom collaborate beautifully they have a great understanding of each other and they really respect each other and it's great to see them sort of work together the mission films are big movies and you know the scope of them the way mccue shoots them the way they're lit the way they're staged it it, it begs to be seen on as big a screen as possible um, not only that, the, the experience of watching a film like this with a whole group of people and sharing the emotion of it, it's a huge part of how much you enjoy the film, I think. You can watch a film on your own and love it, but there is, a, there is something that you get from watching a film with a whole group of people and all of you gasp at the same time and all of you laugh at the same time and you jump at the same time and you look over at people you don't know and you're all experiencing this crazy thing. The relief, the terror. I remember when I watched Fallout with, uh, with um, Angela Bassett and Henry Cavill, we watched it together in a cinema and I just held on to Henry's bicep for the entire film because I was so scared. It's the people, it's the community of cinema. That is what 